everyone. Hello and welcome to today's lunchtime lesson. Um, today we're continuing our focus that we've been doing on how to use conditionals. Um, we're going to be talking about the third conditional today. Um, and after this, we'll have a, a couple more sessions on conditionals. Um, so just to remind you again and recap, like we talked about in the first in the first lesson, why do we use conditionals? Okay. So um, the problem I find with learners using conditionals is that we're normally really obsessed on how we construct it. And the problem with that is that we stop thinking about why we have to use them, yeah? So if we don't consider the pragmatics or the function, okay, of conditionals, so why we use them, we'll never be able to use them correctly, right? So remember that we've got four different kinds of conditionals. Each one has a different function, and some of them are used more commonly than others as well. Um, and very often they will look different to the structures that you're usually taught in a grammar book. And it's important to be able to recognize these. Yeah. So today we are focusing on the third conditional. Um, now, coming to that point, I said before that some structures, some conditionals are used more than other conditionals. Uh, the third conditional is one of these things that we don't actually use very often, right? Um, teachers get obsessed with teaching the third conditional, students get obsessed with learning the third conditional, and it's not really a very common structure. You are going to use the first conditional a lot more in your day-to-day -day lives, especially if you go back to, uh, if you go back and check out the video that we did on the first conditional, especially with those alternative structures, that's gonna be much more helpful and useful language for you than a third conditional will. However, um, the third conditional does get used and if you are going to do an exam or something like that, third conditionals are these things considered more advanced grammar structures that can increase your mark, okay? So that's what we're gonna be thinking about today. So the third conditional, remember that a condition, a conditional always has a condition, yeah? Um, and that means that like the other conditionals we've looked at, there will be two aspects, a situation clause and a consequence clause, okay? So we use the third conditional to talk about hypothetical situations, but in the past, yeah? So that basically means we're using it to talk about things that did not happen, right? For example, here's two scenarios. Here's my situation, miss the bus. Okay, my hypothetical situation and arrive late is my hypothetical consequence. So if I've got my two um, clauses to express this, the situation will use the if clause, although like we've seen before, very often it's not expressed with the word if, and you will have a consequence clause, which will be your auxiliary clause. And the auxiliaries can have lots of different variations, as we've seen before and as we'll see today. So when we learn the third conditional, the most commonly taught structure is this one, right? If with the past perfect and would have class participle. So if I use my example I had before with miss the bus and arrive late, it would look like this in a sentence. If I hadn't missed the bus, I wouldn't have arrived late, okay? But I did miss the bus and I did arrive late. That's the reality. This is the hypothetical past. Um, like we've seen with the first and the second conditional, there are different ways, however, that we can express a hypothetical situation in the past. So here's some examples for you. If it hadn't been for your help, I wouldn't have been able to fix my car. If I'd studied more, I might have managed to go to university. I wouldn't have failed the test if I'd been paying attention. Had it not been for the government's intervention, many more would have suffered. If there had been better organization, there could have been a different outcome. Yeah. So what do you notice about these sentences, right? Because if we have a look at them, they're not actually really following that classic structure that we um, looked at before. We're using some different structures here to express the third conditional, yeah? So if we look at it in more detail, here, I'm not using the past um, if, plus pad perfect, I've got a different structure, right? If it hadn't been for. Here, I'm not using would, 
I'm using might. In this one here, I'm not using the past perfect, I'm using the past perfect continuous. This does not start with if, in fact, if isn't in that clause at all. I'm not using would here, I'm using could, okay? Um, and here we're gonna start to see some similarities to what we saw with both the first and the second conditional, okay? So if we look at these examples here, I'm changing my uh, I'm changing my modal verb would for might or could to be more speculative, yeah. And here I'm not using the just the past perfect simple. I'm using the continuous to put more of a focus on that action, right? So we could summarize how to structure the third conditional like this, right? If with past perfect simple or continuous and in your consequence clause we could use a selection of modals right would might could plus have plus the participle so i'm using might and could like i say to give that speculative idea and i'm using here the past perfect continuous to put more emphasis on the on the um activity of an action sentences here which I want to look at in a bit more detail these ones here if it hadn't been for your help and had it not been for the government's intervention so these are a bit different from the two structures we just saw before and what we need to consider with these ones is the register the tone and the form that we're using them with okay so let's look at this one first if it hadn't been for your help I wouldn't have been able to fix my car so if I, if I wrote that sentence as a normal third conditional, like the ones we always learn in the grammar books, what would it look like? Yeah, just have a little think. How would that sentence look if it was a normal third conditional? Okay. So hopefully you would say this. If you hadn't helped me, I wouldn't have been able to fix my car. Right. So if we look what's changed here, yeah, instead of you, I have a different subject, I have it, okay, and instead of a verb over here, I've got a noun, yeah, and um, I've changed the meaning is the same, but instead of focusing on the person, I'm focusing on the, the activity. Or, or the noun of that action, right? Try this one. If he hadn't worked hard, we couldn't have afforded it. So think about how you would change that sentence using this structure, if it hadn't been for, okay? So take a second, think about your answer. Okay, so. If I transform the sentence, it would look like this. If it hadn't been for his hard work, we couldn't have afforded it. Okay. So um, what I'm changing here is instead of, again, the subject, he, I've changed it to it. And when I'm saying if it hadn't been for, I need to talk about the noun here. Yeah. So if he hadn't worked hard can become if it hadn't been for his hard work. Try one more. If they hadn't paid for the tickets, we wouldn't have been able to go. Okay, so again, how would you change that part of the sentence to reflect if it hadn't been for? Okay, so if I change that part of the sentence, I could say um, a couple of things, right? If it hadn't been for them paying for the tickets, or I can change the verb, if it hadn't been for them buying the tickets, yeah, both of these would be fine, we wouldn't have been able to go. Now you'll notice here, guys, um, I've made my noun using a gerund, okay? So in the previous examples, help is a verb and a noun, work is a verb and a noun but here pay and buy 
we need to use the gerund to transform them into a noun phrase. Okay. All right. So this is something that's much more commonly used in spoken English. It's not something that you should use in your written English. And the register is fairly informal to neutral. We're going to use it a lot when we're chatting with friends and, um, you know, uh, maybe maybe also in a working situation. Uh, but yes, it's got to have this idea of, um, obviously it could be used in writing, but it would be in an informal text like a letter to a friend. It's not something that you would want to produce in an essay, for example, okay? Now, let's think about this structure. Had it not been for the government's interventions, many more would have suffered. Does anyone remember what this is? We saw an example of it with the second conditional. So this one, guys, this is what we call an inversion. Yeah. So we saw it with the second conditional. It's the same idea. And please remember that we use inversions so that you can elevate the register of your writing to be much more formal. So inversions are not something that will appear in written English. Inversions are something, uh, sorry, inversions are not something that will appear in spoken English. It's something that will appear in your written English. But it's a really good skill to be able to produce, especially for anyone planning to take exams in English. Uh, it's a great way really to raise your marks, okay? So if I'm making third conditional inversions, they look like this, yeah? So if we look at what we're doing here, I am taking away my if, yeah, and I'm moving had to the beginning of the sentence. And that's all I'm doing, right? It's really not a complicated thing to do. So instead, if we had arrived sooner, take away if, move had to the front, had we arrived sooner, okay? Here, I've got um, an adjective, right? And all I'm gonna do is the same thing again, take away if, take had, move it to the front of the sentence, okay? Had I been more organized, I'd have been a better student, right? And that's all you have to do. So inversions can sound like really scary, complicated things, but they're not that difficult to produce. And they're um, fantastic for your formal written English, especially in exams, to get those higher marks, okay? So I really recommend trying to bring them into your writing. Right. So remember in the last session we did on the second conditional, I explained that a good way to try and remember how to speak hypothetically in English is this thing about back chaining, okay? And this can be a useful rule when you're not quite sure how you need to structure your sentence. So the rule to remember is that when we speak hypothetically, we always have to go back one tense, right? So if I'm speaking hypothetically, hypothetically, hypothetically about the present, I'm going to go back one step and I'm going to use the past simple to talk about that, right? So if I win, I'll call you would become if I won, I'd call you. Okay. So that's a hypothetical present. And it's the same rule if we want to talk hypothetically about the past, we take one step further back, right? And it would become, if I'd won, I'd have called you, okay? So if you remember that rule, it can be really helpful, especially when you're speaking and trying to speak quickly or fluently to remind yourself about how you need to construct these. please that pronunciation is really important, right? So the third conditional is particularly challenging when we have to produce it fluently and quickly because of the amount of contractions that we will do because there's so many auxiliary verbs. So we will always contract had in the if clause and we will contract would and have in the auxiliary clause, yeah? Let me show you some examples. So here's my long sentence. If I had gotten up earlier, I would have arrived on time, yeah. So we think about which are the auxiliaries here, the ones which are not giving uh, important meaning. I have this one here, I have this one here, and I have this one here. And what that means is that we're gonna contract those 
but we're also going to think about our blocks of sound. Okay, so remember, if I make a contraction with I had, it's not I'd gotten up. Okay, that would be your block of sound if I'd gotten up. Okay, and the same here, if I've got would and have that I need to contract, it's not I'd have. I have to think about my block of sound, I'd have arrived. Yeah, you need to think about all of those sounds being complete together. Okay, so if I was writing it, my contractions would look like this. If I'd gotten up earlier, I'd have arrived on time. I'm not going to do two contractions here because that's confusing and it looks really horrible in written English. I will only contract would. It would be the same here. Remember, if I've got a proper noun, guys, we don't write contractions on proper nouns. We only write contractions on pronouns. So that sentence would look like that, okay? I would never write this if Claire had gotten up. That looks horrible. But I would write it here, she'd. Yeah, she'd have arrived on time. When we're speaking, though, it gets even more complicated. So this is the trailer from a film called uh, Sliding Doors, yeah? So I'm gonna show you the, a clip from this trailer. I don't know if anyone's seen the film. It's Gwyneth Paltrow. It was a very big hit in the 90s. Um, and it's about a woman that um, one day misses a train and her life goes one, in one direction. And it imagines that in the same time she catches the train, and you see her life in the other direction. So you see what would what would have happened if she catches a train or misses a train. So I'm gonna play some of this for you, and then I'm gonna pause it and rewind, and I want you to write down what Gwyneth Paltrow says, okay? So here we go, and I'll tell you when to listen. Have you ever wondered what might have been? Would things be different if you caught the train instead of missing it? How much would your life change if you were 10 minutes early? No. Instead of 10 minutes late. You ready, guys? It's coming up, okay? Write down what Gwyneth Paltrow says. Helen? If I had just caught that train, I'd have been home ages ago. Oh, you don't. Okay, let me rewind it for you. You can listen again. What does she say? If I had just caught that train, I'd have been home ages ago. Oh, you don't want to go. Okay, and one more time. Helen? If I had just caught that train, I'd have been home ages ago. Oh, you don't want to go. Okay, now the reason I'm showing you this is not to make you suffer, but it's to prove that this uh, pronunciation and this contraction is real. Okay, so. This is what Gwyneth Paltrow wrote and said. If I had just caught that train, I'd have been home ages ago. Yeah. Okay. And this shows us the kind of contractions we're making in our pronunciation of the third conditional, right? This is one block of sound. It'll look like that. I'd have been home ages ago. Okay. And what you can see is that these auxiliaries would have completely disappear, right? So um, the part that uh, in, in that transcription, which is saying would have, is this, guys. That part there is would have. Okay, I'd have, right? And that's all disappearing into itself. And this, um, it's, uh, it is a very difficult thing to produce, but it's a really important one to be aware of, okay? So we're contracting all of our auxiliaries and we have to make this block of sound. So if I had had more time, okay? In that sentence, the first had is the auxiliary. The second had is the main verb. So that means I will contract this one here, okay? And you have to think of the block of sound. So it's not if I'd had more time, if I'd had, right? If I'd had, if I'd had more time. I would have gone to the shops. We have our auxiliary here and here. And those are the two that are <coughs> gonna get squashed together. 
and it will become, I'd have gone, okay? I'd have gone, I'd have gone to the shops. So if I said all of that sentence together, if it had more time, I'd have gone to the shops. Yeah, you can try repeating it with me. If I'd had more time, I'd have gone to the shops. And remember that the reason that it's important that we try to produce this pronunciation is for our listening skills, not so much for our speaking skills. If I say that sentence without the contractions, people will understand me. The problem is when you are listening to people and they say it with the contractions, you don't understand them, okay? So remember guys, the mantra, if you can produce a sound, you can hear a sound. So third conditionals, the same way that we saw with second conditionals are really excellent ways for you to be able to illustrate and expand your arguments, right? This can be in both spoken and in written English. And that's because we can use them to create scenarios, okay? So here's some examples. If the internet had existed in the 1960s, politics might have been very different. Yeah, so I'm speaking hypothetically about the past. If it hadn't been for the changes the council made, the city would have lost a lot of money, okay? And these are great ways for me to illustrate and expand on my opinions about things. Had there been a larger investment, we could have seen a significant improvement. That means because of this function that they are fantastic for your writing, guys. If you're doing exams, they're especially useful in essays, in letters of complaints, and in reports. And they're fantastic to bring in to your part three uh, if you're doing proficiency or IELTS exams or part four if you're doing FCE or CAE exam um, in your speaking, okay? Because they are considered more advanced structures and they will get you a higher mark for your language, yeah? Equally, if you're able to pronounce them with those contractions that we just saw before, that will get you a higher pronunciation mark too because then you're demonstrating much more advanced phonological features, yeah? But like I said, guys, at the beginning of the class, in your day-to-day -day English, you are gonna use the first conditional a million times more than you're ever gonna use the third conditional, right? So from a practical level, it's better to spend more time making sure that you understand all of those alternative ways that we saw in our first conditional lesson of expressing first conditionals with words like supposing or provided or in case, yeah? than killing yourself doing lots of third conditional exercises, which is a structure that is not going to organically or naturally come up very often when you're using English, okay? It's great, like I say, especially for your exams to increase your language mark or your pronunciation mark, but in real life, it's not a structure that's gonna appear very often, okay, great. Um, so if you are following our classes, our regular classes, then you're going to have um, access to quite a few exercises to practice the third conditional that we've got in there. And of course, if you would like access to all of those, you can join our classes uh, for a regular, in our regular groups or for the online unlimited uh, course, which is just £50 a month as well.